Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast presented by Zwift. This Voltra Catalunya has not been the most exciting until today. Absolutely insane stage. Medium Mountain Raid, our favorite stages. Stage six from Costa Dorada. You know who's also golden? Richard Carapaz. It's rainy, it's cold. Finishes from Ina Cambrils. So it's the Gold Coast, basically. And we've got the hardest climb of the day, the Col de las Siebres Musara, 10.5K, 6%, and then it's rolling medium mountain all day until the uh, Col or Col de la Teixeta, and then a descent to the finish. So tricky day, cold conditions as it's been all week. As a reminder of the GC positions going into this stage, it is tight. Almeida one second ahead of Quintana, but behind him on deadlock. Igita on seven seconds, one Ayuso goat, 18 seconds with Pools and O'Connor, then Johannes and Enemy, 21 seconds, Guillaume Martin, 24, Carapaz, 27. So it's all very tight. Before we get into the chaos, which Benji's chronicled from various sources, mention our show partners, Zwift. Before the stage started, when this was all kicking off, I actually went my first outdoor ride for a while. Do a little 15-minute test, nothing, not full gas, just the regular climb I do to Asnuri, just south of the border, and I knocked three minutes off it since I did it last in December. So I'm stoked, and that's pretty much 100% due to being able to get on Zwift during stages, during the cold winter here in Andorra, which is something I've never experienced before, and after we've done the pod recaps, if I miss exercise after we finish up and then I do the video, being able to get on Zwift just for an hour each day has made a huge, huge difference. So I'm stoked. I've actually noticed relatively the same thing when it comes to my riding on Zwift, where my heart rate has gone down like 25 on the same similar ride in the span of three months, which is kind of insane. <laughs> but I guess it's fun. If you want to check out Zwift yourself, you can go to Zwift.com for your free seven-day trial, already paying dividends to both me and Benji. But Chaos Benji, fire live stats or wherever you saw it, what was going on at the start here? Yes, the Catalonia live ticker was the place to be for me in the earlier parts of the stage. And we saw that action was happening on the first climb. It wasn't clear which team was actually causing the initial action, but I'm guessing Ineos by the amount of riders that were in the front group composition early on, because there was a group that was away from the initial peloton, including Quintana, Higita, Johansson, Pools, O'Connor, Skielmos, Guillaume Martin, Carapaz, Plap, Storo, Romo, Ciccone, Carlos Rodriguez, Rodriguez, Verona, Hindley, Turns, Kreisweg, and now Castro Viejo. No riders from UAE in that, so that's intriguing. And then three riders attacked from that group. That was Higita, Carapaz, and Luke Plap. Luke Plap as domestique for Carapaz, knowing that Carapaz is the GC rider for Ineos in this race. He got a bit of a gap, and then we saw that two riders of UAE actually bridged up to that Quintana group, which was a user in Soler, and who was left in the peloton, Almeida. And it was kind of curious. I was like, okay, what's happening over here? Is Almeida, is Almeida having a bad day, or are they attacking their leader? And at that point, it's unknown what was the situation. We can't guess really, but it shouldn't be happening that Ayuso and Soler are attacking at that point. At least not Soler, in my opinion. You can say, let's keep Ayuso with the other leaders. But I'd argue that Soler should be with Almeida at that point in the race. What's your thought there? Yeah, I think I think Soler should have been with Almeida. Ayuso bridging with them. He's close on GC. I think that's good as a defensive maneuver. I forgot to mention, by the way, that Ethan Vernon won the sprint stage yesterday, but it wasn't very exciting. So that's all. Um, <laughs> You've been updated. Well done. Uh, yeah, it's it's an incredible job from Ineos. With Carapaz, that's, Carapaz not that close on GC ninth. They've woken up today. They've seen the rain. You know how he is, Apex Predator, Jaguars like wet and cold conditions. He's like, this is, this is why he's so good and wins so many races, Benji. Because on the pure mountaintop finish, sort of wasp a kilo test, Adam Yates will torch him. But in a, just a miserable, nasty stage, he's like, yeah, I can take some time here. Are you so, I don't know, it's, it, we'll have to look at the data. Maybe Benji Almeida was really struggling 
maybe Ayuso was doing like a steady pace, same with Soler, and they're like, what is going on? Isn't that sort of similar what happened in uh, the Giro when he lost four minutes on stage one? Just, just didn't have it. Yeah, but here it wasn't necessarily that the gap immediately went to four minutes. He was still in like the larger peloton group with most of the riders there. So perhaps his positioning was the issue that they weren't expecting a maneuver here and therefore reacted late. That's also a possibility, but it's the biggest climb of the day. They should have been aware that something could happen on this stage. And I'm pretty sure some of the competitors actually said that it could have been a GC stage. So if you look at the parkour, there's not too many places on the parkour where it can be very GC like it's uh the two biggest climbs and the first one's pretty early but hey that three leader group at the front Higita Plap Carapaz actually started extending their lead 12 seconds at first on that Quintana group went to 30 seconds went to 45 seconds and then that second group with Ayuso and Soler got caught by the Almeida group so that's all back together and that's intriguing because we're now coming towards the top of this climb and we know that there's intermediate sprints there where people can take time I was like okay Perhaps someone will try and sprint for like the third spot or something in those intermediate sprints, but I don't think those intermediate sprints will be the biggest uh, effect on this stage. I'm I'm seeing that Plap is domesticating for Carapaz, hard pacing, expanding that gap, continuing that, and we know that in the group behind, if Almeida has Soler and Ayuso, then Soler is the one domesticating, and Ayuso is very unlikely to be a domestique today for Almeida on this stage. We've seen it in Ligwig Leo that he's not too likely to ride for anyone else if he's in relatively good form and has a chance at still winning. And today that was still the case. And we saw that Soler was doing most of the work when the broadcast started, when the gap had already expanded to, what was it? Two minutes? 1.23 when Plap pulled off. Plap pulled yep. off and got in the car. I was like, I'm out. Cheers, boys. <laughs> Done my job. <laughs> Um, his Insta caption the other day after I was, don't know where I am, the geolocation was somewhere fucking cold, I think he said, and I agree, like it's cold in Catalonia at the moment, 109 kilometers to go, 109, two men in front, gap of 123, which expands. So I think, I think Soler was fucked, Oliveira is not there, Ayuso is not pulling, and Costa's coming back he's not he doesn't have the legs anymore to do six for 12 and then recover and so the gap just blows up with no one else helping uae and are you so not pacing we assume i actually it's not all on him gc leaders should pace for themselves too but maybe almeida couldn't do it should the other teams have helped should arkea should age to r for o'connor bahrain for polls if you were in the car in their, as their DS, would you have said, all right, let's not let this get ridiculous and keep it at 130? Oh, I think it's uh, that's a, an interesting aspect because on one end you'd say, well, Quintana also has positions to lose here. He's only second on one second. So basically both Almeida and Quintana are attacked here, but I think Quintana was like, okay, I'm not going to send my entire team to help here, but I'm also pretty sure that in the group that Quintana was in with Almeida and so forth, that his teammates weren't necessarily there yet. Because when the broadcast started, there was this peloton after that group that started coming back, led by Arkea riders. So I was thinking that perhaps the issue was that the Arkea riders weren't there to help. But the problem so. that, or the thing that then happened afterwards is that second group catches up with the Arkea riders and they still don't pace. And I don't know, I would have... I would have probably let them pace because otherwise, why are they here? I'm pretty vindictive, so I would have yelled and like, let's let's see UAE burn and <laughs> make them pace for 60, 70 kilometers and then let's try and attack Almeida later. Rather than if you put your team at the front, close this down, you're just going to preserve the status quo and you probably you probably don't get anywhere. So... I wouldn't have helped them pace and because they had four riders in the group, but two of them wouldn't pace, Almeida and Ayuso. So if Almeida's not going to de- defend his own lead on the climbs, then well, you know, why should you? Anyway, status quo for a long time now. Gap goes to 320, 50 Ks to go. Coverage is kicked in. We see Costa and Soler pacing on these shorter climbs. On every climb, they lose time. The gap goes to 320. On each descent between them, it goes to 250. 
even though Egita was descending much faster than Carapaz, absolutely lethal on the descents, uh, the little monster. And we saw Solé go back to the car. No, we saw a conversation, Benji. It's getting close. 35, 40 k to go. We saw a conversation between Costa and Soler. Soler says, I'm done. Goes back to the car, gets a feed, gets the sticky bottle of a generation, <laughs> and then just hard drops. <laughs> and Costa, he did a good job, but Chris Horner, our colleague, he said this once. He was in a race where he there was a flat section afterwards and a long flat section, and he wanted his domestiques there to pace for him. But there was a gradual climb before, and he's like, he went on the front and paced to give them some rest so they could get over it. UA did the opposite. Almeida's letting completely cooked Rui Costa pace. I think Almeida should have gone on the front. I know Ayuso obviously should have in theory, but at some point you've got to defend your own GC. Yeah, I think so as well. And perhaps we are overrating the energy on Almeida today. Perhaps he was completely done for after that first climb and was on full survival mode, hanging on for the entire day. Like, we we are not Almeida. But I'm guessing from what I've seen on that bigger climb... Well, then again, is there an issue with Almeida when it comes to chaotic rainy stages? That one in the Giro was also chaotic rainy medium mountain stage. The one in Paris was also not his best performance also similarly rain and chaotic are we seeing a pattern here or am i in- inventing that well he's he's a poor descender so he struggles he's doing more energy on the descents and it's more stressful so he struggles there in the wet he's worse and then maybe gets demoralized i don't know but it's the guy who was strongest on boy told by far really struggling today anyway you know x eventually start to help pace for some Peculiar reason. I thought they would have used the last climb as a launch pad to attack with Johannesson. Um, but anyway, they bring the gap down a little bit, but not too much, down to two minutes. And we're like, okay, well, Egeza and Carapaz can't attack each other then on this climb because the crest of this is, let me do quick maths. It's like 30 Ks from the finish. And they need to be together to the finish if the gap is now at 150, 155. They crest it, looking good. Aguirre on the descent, gapping Carapaz. He kept the gap at like 140 on the peloton. We see Almeida's second wheel. Ayuso had come to the front at the end of the climb, pacing for the first time. And we see a gap open. He waits. Almeida closes it. Next shot, Benji. Ayuso solo. I don't know <laughs> what happened. <laughs> this is like mob this is worse than peak Movistar. <laughs> yes, I think so as well. And the thing is, like, we've seen already this race, we've seen it before. I mentioned like Weglia again. Like, we've seen that when he's in the chance of having a victory, it is unlikely that Ayuso will be working for a leader. And Almeida, well, let's be honest about it, he hasn't had the best season so far. He had a good mountain stage this week, but does that make you clear leader when you gain only what was it 15 seconds on Ayuso, perhaps? on that stage so i don't know i think ayuso still thought to himself well if he can't do it i'll do it myself he's 19 inexperienced when it comes to working for others clearly and he decided to go off on his own and i think he shouldn't have done that i know you slightly disagree <laughs> i disagree I'll, i want to hold i got a full almeida ayuso thought Same. train that i need some space after i do the top 10 but um <laughs> Almeida's then dropped from G2 chasing Ayuso. It's Poles, Pernsteiner, and Turns all get big buffs in wet weather and medium mountain. We know this. They're with Quintana. Ayuso's taken one bonus second away from Quintana at the end of that descent. The gap is now 55 seconds to a minute, 14 Ks to go. We have three groups. Bike Exchange chasing for Groves, who's still here, by the way doing a really good job there. Sprinter, who's already won a stage, they're about 10 seconds behind Quintana and the three Bahrain pacing, but they're not going to bring back Carapaz and Aguita. I should say Ayuso eventually sat up and sort of pretended to be fiddling with his radio and went into the Quintana group. Aguita and Carapaz, I think Aguita was pulling 80% of the time. And eight, definitely when you factor in how hard he was pulling, they get to the finish, do we think, have they done an agreement? where Carapaz gets the stage or whatever. No, 
They sit up, they're finessing, not too much, but a little bit. And Agita could finesse a bit. The gap was 45 seconds. He's only seven seconds or so behind. He opens up the sprint with 125 to go. And El Haguar, imagine you're walking through a rainforest and you can't see anything. It's wet. There's a branch. And El Haguar de Tulcan launches. You can't even see him from your back wheel. Nails Igita on the line. That's why he's the apex predator. He has to do it with a bike that's heavier. It's now at least the correct color. They've done redone it, and it's gold now. <laughs> Unbelievable from the two of them. I didn't expect this. I thought Catalonia's been a little bit shit, and then today, Benji. Unbelievable stage. And... I love that they sprinted for it. I, I, I said yesterday, I thought Wout and Laporte should have sprinted wow. for it. So I love they went for it. <laughs> yeah, but these are different themes. There's a big difference here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I agree that at first it looked like Higita was pacing quite a bit longer and that he knew that Carapaz would not take over anymore in the last kilometer. And it was clear that Carapaz was not going to take over and Higita still kept a bit of a tempo. It wasn't like he was completely finessing like you mentioned then. Yeah, being in second wheel at that point, Higita's pretty fast, Carapaz is relatively fast as well. I don't know, if if they ride the other way around, Higita could potentially win, but it wasn't that way, so Carapaz takes the victory, and it's great to see that, because this might inspire others to try stuff like this on stages when they're behind crazy attacks on the first climb of the day, and see if they can do it, because this is the second time that UAE gets absolutely destroyed on a stage like this by an attack on the first climb get ourselves back to that stage race Kovi was leader in same story they got smashed by a group attacking on the first climb Kovi lost his leader jersey today they get smashed by Karapaz and Higita and Plap lose leader jersey so a bit of a pattern that we start seeing there and that's intriguing and I like that but uh next to that I want to say that after today's Almeida and a Yuzo story I will give you the time to say your rant well, so top Ayuso got caught and then the Quintana group got caught because Bike Exchange didn't know the gap and they kept pacing for Groves. Groves won the sprint for third, still a good level for him. Then Velasco, Pache, Backlines, Barcelo got off. Skielmers, Jensen, Van der Nabil. The revised GC, Igita goes into the lead, 16 seconds ahead of Carapaz. Almeida down into third on 52, still a second ahead of Quintana. Ayuso fifth on 108, Poles sixth on 110 same time as o'connor johannesson trine and henley round out the top 10 my almeida and a Uso rant is this i don't think almeida has been the strongest rider for uae throughout this race i agree he was stronger at the end of boy toll but and I think the problem is still they should have picked one and then made you, – you pick your you pick your choice and then you have to die with it a little bit. If they fail, they fail. But La Molina, he attacked three times chasing O'Connor. He pulled as well. And Almeida didn't pull until the last 350 metres when I think he was going for himself. And then Ayuso won the sprint. Ayuso was so strong on La Molina – and missed out on stage win and bonuses and yada, yada, yada. Almeida didn't pull for him. That's fine. Whatever. They're going for their own GC, right? That's how it was. They're going for their own GC. And I heard from the peloton, someone looked behind and said, so are you, so what are you doing second wheel? Why won't you pull? When O'Connor was up the road, he said, I'm riding my own race. That was what was said on stage three to La Molina. Stage four, they run their own race. Almeida bridges back to whoever was up the road, Aguita and Carapaz. Ayuso dropped, O'Connor dropped, and Almeida keeps pacing, which was hurting his own stage win chances because he was pacing Quintana and stuff. He'd already dropped uh, O'Connor, and Ayuso was trying to catch back. So he screws over Ayuso there, which is, again, fine, whatever. But then don't expect a guy to, to pull for you all day for 100 Ks in the rain on stage six. And if I was Ayuso, and I'm, listen, hand on heart, I'm a bad person. I wouldn't help helped Almeida. I might, not, I might not have attacked him on the descent. That was too much. But pulling all day in the rain? I don't think so. Uh, I think that this is a uh, team car issue as well. If you are DS of this team and you go to this race, at first you need to be clear that two riders can be leader or multiple riders can be leader. But it needs to be clear before the race that at a certain point... The DS can make the decision that one of them is leader and the others have to work for them. That is something that should happen in every team. When the DS makes that decision, that should be the case. And 
in my opinion, they should have made the decision after Boitol. I said it after that stage. For me, Almeida was leader after that stage. And I'd argue that perhaps they decided otherwise on the initial climb of today. When Almeida was having trouble there, perhaps that was the reason that they said to Ayuso, perhaps now we don't trust Almeida completely today. And therefore, just try something. But on the other hand, I think that Almeida also didn't drop and lose like five minutes on the group of Quintana and so forth. He wasn't completely done for. There were three riders up the road, two of which were GC riders. They're in a group with, yeah, Costa comes back, Soler comes back. The user was not pacing the entire stage, gets to that climb, doesn't really do anything on the climb as well, and attacks in the descent, and then basically sits back in the peloton after they are caught again. So I would have argued the gap is 40 seconds and the end of today's stage. This is a bit hindsight, but I'd argue if Ayuso had pace before the climb and didn't necessarily do an attack, but kept tempo after the climb, like right now he got caught and he just sat up in the group because other people tried attacking again, riders from Equipo and Pharma and so forth. So when that happens, you know, the tempo is not high. The gap could have been a lot lower, and I'd argue that UAE could have been in the lead. And 100%. It would also depend on who they choose as leader. I think if they choose a user as leader, they're also still in the lead. If they choose yep. Almeida as leader, they're also still in the lead. But they didn't choose a leader when they needed to. And I'd argue it's not easy to choose a leader necessarily, because you're playing with the feelings of your leaders. But you signed Almeida on a million-dollar contract, uh, more than a million-dollar contract. A user was a 19-year-old. This is the moment to choose Almeida over Yuzo because he's got plenty of times and plenty of years to come a Yuzo that he's going to be leader in races. That's why I would choose Almeida at the moment. Lance Armstrong, Chris Froome, <laughs> Alberto Contador. <laughs> what would they have done? If you, I like what I saw from Ayuso. It's terrible <laughs> teamwork. But the psycho Tour de France GC guys, they yeah. do the same thing. Like. Yeah. 2000 this reminded me of contador lance in the tour yeah. it, was, it was mental so i like it mainly because it gives something for us to talk about as well insane stage but i agree you have to it, it's not a good look for the car i think benji because yeah. the car today has shown a lack of control over the team and how it's working and i agree with you if if a are you so just gives a little bit on some of the climbs when costa was fully cooked this, they bring them back. Um, but anyway, we got Basque Country to look forward to where we have Ayuso, Bennett, Formolo, Mike, and McNulty, Soler. So they got six leaders there. That'll be very, very exciting. What do you think? <laughs> I think we've dwelled on any, uh, on UAE a lot. Ineos and Ag- I want to give a more props to Agita. Yeah. Agita oh, yeah. is looking really, really good. Algarve, the descending today unbelievably good performance and i really hope he holds on yeah i think so as well and i was a bit more thinking that higita in previous years was the guy that was good in medium mountain stages with a bit of a sprint at the end uh from a uh group of riders that can get up the mountain like in alto de foya for example where he had the incident with tobias falls but he showed on Poitol, which is a relatively long climb that he can also do some stuff there he showed here on a medium mountain stage that is chaotic AF in the rain that he can also do chaos which we didn't see in Tirreno last year when he got absolutely destroyed on that on that Casa Fidardo stage from my memory because at a certain point I saw him dropping completely and I swear he lost like 20 minutes or I'm thinking about a completely different stage but nonetheless when it comes to Higita ah I just hope that he can keep this uh, he can keep this up and when we look at what he he's got to do this year he signed up for the Vuelta so it's unfortunate that we will have to wait so long for a, G, a Grand Tour for him and perhaps this is a good sign for his hill classics because after Itulia, Flesh Wallon, LBL, I don't believe in Flesh that much when it comes to Higita compared to an LBL opportunity. Uh, I like Flesh a little bit more just because I don't know about yep. him in the 250k races. Yep. I think there's a chance for redemption for UA tomorrow. It's a small chance, but it is the stage to try something. The Barcelona Monduif Castle circuit stage, beautiful one to spectate. 140 Ks, they have some light, medium mountain early, then they go into town, and then they do laps of the Alt del Castell de Montjuic. 2.4 Ks, 4.7%. That is fake news. There's a 12% pinch of like 400 meters at the end of this. This is the climb that De Gent ruined Morich on 
to win the stage from the break last year. The fight for the break is often very fierce with a lot of talented riders who have made it this far wanting to get in there. Almeida's at 52 seconds. Ayuso's at 108. Again, as Benji said, if they just kept that gap to 20, then something is more is more likely to happen. But 52 in a minute is a lot. How do you think they should play it? I think they should try and get them roll attacks, try and get to breaks. They I can think so as well. Uh, just make it a hard race when it comes to the start of the Monjuic circuits. Yeah. My Catalan is not as good as is yours, I'm afraid, but <laughs> I'm trying okay. Mondrewick circuits, yes, that's the word. I think they should try and make it a hard race from that point onwards, try and isolate leaders from the other teams and then try and strike on rolling attacks. And like, who are the biggest teams when it comes to the ones that you can isolate? And Carapaz is certainly one that should be isolatable, I dare to say, because half his team is not here anymore. Nah, he's Castro good. Castro and good. Rodriguez should be fine though, right? Yeah. He's good. Compared to what other teams have left, Egeet yeah. is the one. It's like, is Henley going to be able to do the job? I would take Castro and Rodriguez. Yeah, true. And Castro is definitely uh, one of the better domestiques in the world. So yeah. I agree on that aspect. Are there other competitors that you see uh, still having a challenge? Quintana, no. who uh, didn't really have a team today. I don't see it either to gain no. time on that. So yeah, I Bahrain. believe in a... Ooh, Bahrain? Bahrain so. with O'Connor... They should try something. Turns, Pernsteiner, Poles. They hopefully will try something. O'Connor's got God on maybe to set him up beforehand. He's good sort of hilly racer. And I think Ineos will try. There's no way Ineos do this just for a little stage win, Benji. They, they want GC. I think they're going to try. Yeah. And it's 16 seconds. And then people are going to look at a Gita. And that's when we'll know. Yeah. I think... Uh... I think it's very likely that one of the two riders at the top of GC win GC tomorrow, Carapaz or Higita. And I think it's more likely going to, I don't know. I feel like Higita is good enough and can use the Carapaz train, to be honest, against UAE. He's looking good and his descending is good. And if he goes to a sprint, he's damn fast too. So I can't wait to watch. It's set up very, very nicely, and I hope Ineos tries something. Again, we hope you enjoyed this recap. As you can tell, we both got pretty excited by some good racing. Tomorrow we have Gent Vevelhem men and women's recaps and Catalonia Stage 6 or 7, whatever it is. Big weekend of racing to finish there. And then next week we've got prepping for Tour of Flanders, and then we've got Dwarves Tour of Landrens. So it never stops. There's an article up on lanternrouge.com.au which is ranking the top 10 climbing performances of the season so far. Some surprising ones in there that you might not expect. And yeah, that's all I've got. Benji's got his PCM trailer review, I think, out at the moment. Um, whether he's flattering, not sure on that <laughs> on that aspect. It's to steal a phrase from, from the man himself. And yeah, we'll see you at the Sunday recaps tomorrow. Thanks to Swift as always. Ciao.